Anin Bujou, good morning, everybody. Um, lovely to see so many people out. I feel very uh, privileged to be part of this conversation. Um, my name is Danny Kwan Lafond. I'm an assistant professor in the sociology department at UTSC, and I'm going to start us off this morning. Uh, I'll do a land acknowledgement first, and then uh, I will hand it over to the students after that. So, good morning. My name is Danny. Um, I'm a mixed race woman of color born in Treaty 4 territory. I have family and community ties to Anishinaabe, Metis, Chinese, Francophone, and queer communities in this territory, uh, but I do not self identify or take up leadership as any of these. I've been the beneficiary of Indigenous knowledge, and so I find it appropriate that as a settler in this territory, I should know whose land I'm on and I should know it well. And so I'll do my best to share with you uh, what I've learned. Since time immemorial, Indigenous people living in societies and nations were here. The Anishinaabek Nation is massive. It has several dialects and communities in different regions, including Toronto, which is situated in Mississauga Territory, part of the larger Anishinaabek Nation. Also, the Haudenosaunee Nation, or Six Nations, has been here and or in territories on the south side of the Great Lakes since time immemorial. And the Dish with One Spoon uh, Treaty tells us this local history. It's an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe to share this land peacefully, taking only what's needed and always leaving something for others. This treaty making agreement happened long before and without Europeans. The Haldeman Proclamation is a 1784 land transfer of the Grand River Territory to the Haudenosaunee and today, an hour's drive west of Toronto, land defenders are occupying what's known as 1492 Land Back Lane. The Six Nations Reserve today is around 5% of the land base that was, legally, that was legally transferred to them. And I encourage you to go learn more about this if you're unfamiliar with that history. I'd also like to acknowledge that today, Toronto is home to a large, active, and diverse urban Indigenous community from many nations. Um, I'm almost done. I want to also acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit, who are the treaty signatories in Toronto proper, and also the Eastern Mississauga communities, um, such as Curve Lake First Nation, who are the signatories to the Williams Treaties and the keepers of a lot of that knowledge, um, on which Scarborough sits today. So in the language of this territory, miigwech for being here today. Before I pass it over to students, I'd like to share a bit about um, how this roundtable event came to be. So it was organized by four amazing students, Randa Omar, Tianyi Wang, Yi Li, and Rajpreet Sidhu. Um, they're working on a year-long multidisciplinary capstone project in the School of Cities, and I've been fortunate to supervise the project this year. The project uh, was to work with a public arts organization, so in this case, STEPS Public Art, in order to think and learn more about how, uh, in the context of a push for truth and reconciliation in Canada, organizations may work with artists um, positively in how they think about their work and relationships. It was vitally important in this project that the students learn directly from Indigenous artists, and yet in this pandemic year, community visits um, have not been possible. So this roundtable, which is supported by the School of Cities, Anti-Black Racism slash Black Lives and Anti-Indigenous Racism slash Indigenous Lives initiative is one way of filling the gap for the students so that they can sit with and learn directly from Indigenous artists. Um, on behalf of the students, I'd like to thank the School of Cities for their support. In particular, um, shout out to Corals and Cecilia who've been um, incredibly helpful taking care of all the back end and setting up the Zoom and registration and many other aspects of logistics. Uh, speaking of logistics, so we've turned on the live transcripts um, and you should be able to see that, but we all just want you to know that uh, when people speak in Anishinaabe Moen or other languages, the spelling is not accurate, unfortunately. Um, and lastly, I want to say a special chimigwech to Lindsay Lickers, who's on this panel um, and who's provided feedback and support on several occasions for the students and for all of the panelists uh, for making time today. So with that, uh, you won't hear much more from me today. Thank you so much. I'll hand it over to Randa now to begin the discussion. Thank you. Everyone, thank you so much, Danny. And thank you everyone for being here. Uh, maybe we could start with uh, introductions by the panelists. Um, Annie, can we start with you? For sure. Hi, Annie Tansi, Annie Beach, Nadis Nagasin. Hi, my name is Annie Beach. Um, I'm a visual artist, first and foremost. 
um, among being a muralist, art instructor, facilitator, kind of working in admin a little bit, um, doing a bunch of different things. Um, but born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, Treaty One territory. Um, so it's an hour early over here. So I'm still a little waking up, but happy to be here and be a part of this. Um, yeah, I uh, graduated from the University of Manitoba School of Art um, last uh, June, I guess, officially. Didn't have like a, a big celebration with like COVID, so I had to do it from home, but super proud that I got to have that whole experience. Um, university for me was like building uh, and like grew up with my primary, primarily uh, a primarily white school uh, my entire life, my childhood. Um, and grew up with like my dad who's like Ukrainian Eastern European descent um, so my connection to my indigenous identity was something that was more a project that I took upon myself to connect with that culture um, it was an identity that like I held on to and like knew a little bit about that but didn't even it wasn't something that was like kind of just removed from my family and was something that was not talked about um, so through art primarily using that as a means to connect with other people and then build a community um, and then being a, a school of art student at the University of Manitoba um, and building connections through the Indigenous Student Association there um, built a community um, and from there build, building a practice of a lot of like collaborative projects um, murals we're working with different organizations with youth and other other groups and um, yeah, just really working, working towards uh, building uh, positive public art and just existence of art here in Winnipeg is is what I've been working towards. Um, so that's, I guess, a little bit about me, and I'll pass along to whoever else wants to share. Lindsay, would you like to go next? Thanks, Annie. You said me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Thanks. awesome. Uh, so, Ani Bojo Mashe Kene the Clan Dish Nakaz Nuzuki and Dodam Six Nations Nasaki Kundunjaba. So, my English name is Lindsay Lickers, and I'm uh, originally from Six Nations of the Grand River, and I'm Turtle Clan, and my traditional name translates to Medicine Water Woman. Um, and my matriarchal line is actually with the Mississaugas of Credit First Nations, so I'm both Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. Um, a little bit about myself and my practice. So I was just writing this down because I always like every time we talk about these things, you have to reflect, right, and see what everything you've done. I always forget stuff too. <laughs> um, but and I calculated it out. I've actually been a practicing artist for going on 17 years. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but yes, I've been doing it for a really long time. Uh, I'm a graduate of the of OCAD University, and I also was uh, president of the Student Indigenous Students Association when I was there. Um, I also sat on the education council that was uh, set to develop the first undergraduate uh, indigenous visual arts program. So I was a part of that process as well. Um, I also previously, or following that, I had uh, spent four years as the arts coordinator for seven generation image makers through Native Child and Family Services. So that was 100% dedicated to providing um, arts access for youth at risk um, and youth in care. And um, hmm, what else have I done? I've been an instructor at Polytechnic uh, on Six Nations. And currently I consult for Art Starts for the STEPS Initiative, which is part of why I'm here on this panel and also North York Arts. And um, I'm also recently just joined the Indigenous Advisory Council for the Toronto Arts Council. Um, and I'm doing some jury work with Mississauga and uh, the most predominant work I've done in terms of public art probably is my block line stop in the Waterloo region. And it's a big installation that's part of the LRT um, system that they did, the revitalization. So I, was do I did that um, and have some other projects coming out. I'm actually going to be in Nuit Blanche in 2022. So that's exciting, just got that word. So starting to look at constructing that and what's that gonna look like, uh, starting to work on that this year. And um, yeah, I'm just really happy to be here. And just, I guess for my arts practice, um, I think I'm really influenced by the fact that I did a lot of work with uh, youth and care. So that was really my first big professional stint as an artist. Um, and then from there, I started diving into advocacy work 
Um, so I've actually been doing on my day job um, because arts is something that I do, um, you know, as not really side because it takes up just as much time as it does doing <laughs> nine to five work. Um, but I'm also very passionate about, you know, what I do in my day to day, which is um, supporting Indigenous women through a lot of really significant issues in conjunction with MMIWG, human trafficking and gang involvement. So that's what I do in my day job. So I'm very much um, influenced by social social work um, and then also undertaking my own commitment to, uh, you know, restoring my own traditional identity and in, engaging in participating and supporting as Nashka Bay West and a helper in the community. So um, all of that mixed together is what really fuels my arts practice. Um, so that's just to give everybody an understanding of where I come from and my expertise. And actually that at Seven Generation Image Makers is the first time I met Niall. So I was able to work with Niall a lot in the past. So um, it's uh, really nice to see Niall on the panel and yeah, so thank you so much. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and congrats for Nuit Blanche. Um, I'm so excited to see it. Now, would you like to go next? Yeah, definitely. Um, and then a bonjour, which pensez me gaze, an indigenous cas, me me guinsi sat nenda sokna, me me guinsi sat ne do dem, ne a shignig ming. Ne donje ba minwa, tekranto ne donje ba minwa, michi makanak mission na be a ki, ne donje ba. My, uh, my name on my birth certificate is uh, Niall Johnston. Uh, my spirit name or my name to creation is Whistling Eagle, which will say Migize. I guess um, I go by Migize for short, which is White Headed Eagle. I'm with the Little People Clan and originally from Neoshignigaming First Nations, also known as the um, uh, also known as the place surrounded uh, or the peninsula surrounded, uh, surrounded by water on three sides. We also know it as the beautiful place. Um, I lived there probably till I was about 14 and then came down to uh, Tecranto to kind of pursue um, high school and like little, take my education a little bit more seriously. Uh, I am like, I have, I don't know, I guess I have many different roles in the community. Um, first and foremost, I like to say I'm a helper, uh, not an Ashkabelis or a traditional helper, um, a mural artist, a painter. Um, also, I had the extreme privilege of um, apprenticing with, with many different storytellers growing up. Um, so a lot of, I guess, the teachings that I share come from my great grandmother, uh, Verna Najuan or Verna Johnston, as well as uh, Basil Johnston. Um, and I'm just really excited. Oh my gosh, I keep seeing family members pop up here that I haven't seen in a while. Um, so I'm really, I guess, just honored and, and humbled to be able to, to share a little bit about my practice and just a little bit about what I do. I currently, like I'm uh, currently working with an organization that my partner founded uh, called Finding Our Power Together, where we address, um, I guess, uh, suicide prevention for First Nations youth across Canada and um, really I guess helping out that way is sharing cultural teachings um, and I guess just art as a methodology of well-being and as a methodology of reclamation of, of language, of culture, of identity. And and yeah, it's a little bit about what I do. And just say to miigwech, thank you. Thank you so much, Now We're very happy to have you with us. Uh, Shannon, hello. Hi. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. So I'm not an artist. <laughs> I'm on this panel a little differently. Although I did go to art school, but I flunked out, which I think actually makes me an artist. Um, so yeah, I definitely flunked out of Windsor's art school. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm Indigenous uh, with uh, uh, Scottish settler ancestry as well. Uh, my mom was taken in the 60s scoop. So um, similar to Annie, uh, my pursuit of that was on my own. My family was really secretive about being Indigenous. Um, lots of fear um, that people would find out. There was a lot of uh, racism within my family. Um, and so uh, my decision to like pursue that and find teachers, which I've been very fortunate to have uh, many Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee teachers, um, was uh, much to the dismay of my family. So a uh, bit of a, a personal journey there. Um, my reason Danny and um, the students invited me today is that I do a lot of work in Indigenous settler relations. 
um, particularly in post-secondary institutions, but also with art galleries. So I've worked with the Gardner and RMG and some smaller galleries. Um, so, and I do a lot of training with uh, non-Indigenous individuals on how to um, be better at reconciliation. <laughs> I don't even know that I could say good at it, just better. Um, and uh, and very in the very near future, I will be opening a, an Indigenous career bookstore here in Peterborough, and we will be also running a co-op out of there um, to kind of a lot of my work has unfortunately been only for non-Indigenous groups, and so this will be an opportunity to bring some more of my work to the Indigenous community, um, particularly youth in care, which is something I am very passionate about. So um, that's a bit of who I am. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Shannon. And again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I guess we can get started with the discussion. Um, the first question we had was, um, knowing that you're all committed to living and working in a good way and embedded in your cultures and um, your teachings, um, how does this come through in your work? Um, I know, Lindsay, we've spoken a bit about this before. Maybe you'd like to get us started off. Way to put me on the spot. <laughs> um, well, like I mentioned earlier too, right? Like, I think because I do some of that community work and as well as like, just like Niall, like being a helper, I think that it's really, at least for myself, I can't speak for anybody else, but I find that it's really difficult for me to separate the two, like to separate all of those things from my creating and my practice. Um, and I think that that, and I, I mean, I've talked to a lot of, you know, working with a lot of other indigenous artists and being in the community for so long, I feel like that's a common theme that, that you know, is permeates through a lot of, you know, all of us working in this space. And um, because again, I think that that in of itself is a recognition of our traditional ways of being is everything is interconnected. There is no compartmentalizing. And especially when you look at, you know, if I'm going out and talking about even some broader issues, um, I mentioned earlier before the panel started that I was actually out presenting um, on some other topics and actually talking about just that, right? About how everything is connected. Mental health is connected to, um, you know, our connection to the land. Our connection to the land is connected to, you know, having even um, a good spirit and motivation to paint, for example, or to bead or to do these things. Um, so there's, there's this inherent interconnectedness that at least I recognize within my work. Um, so it's really hard for me to separate the two. And it's really just a matter of just being who we are, right? Like. I just am who I am, and that's all a part of me. So that's kind of how I look at it in terms of my practice. Thank you, Lindsay. Would anyone else like to jump in before I call them out? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I can jump in. Okay. Oh, we're at the same time. You first. Awkward. No, no, please, you go first. No, it's kind of like um, just echoing what Lindsay was saying. Like, I always, especially within my work, I always let, as a community helper, I let the community kind of guide my practice. Um, and like Lindsay was saying, this, I was always doing this work. I've noticed that there's a, there's a lot of youth that are really reaching out for the culture and for the teachings. And and just reflecting in my own life, like it, it was, it's, I always say that it, it was such a privilege to be able to grow up in the ceremony community. It was such a privilege to be able to grow up close to the stories and learning and learning about the stories and having those passed to me. It was such a privilege to be able to, to Shkabe and learn from traditional medicine people. And so like my, my, I guess my duty is, is to bring those teachings forward so that next generation can, can can learn and be inspired and and not have to struggle through their identity trying to find their identity and, and just and just kind of create just kind of create a space where, where it's a little bit easier than I guess what I experienced growing up and like right now I guess what I love seeing is is like I'm doing it for my children as well like if I if I sit there and, and I start painting or I start drawing florals 
or like Ojibwe florals, they're 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 asking questions, and then I'm I'm able to sit down with them and really talk about the, the stories of a of a particular flower or of a particular image, and and with that comes comes the language. I can talk. I can start teaching the language. I can start. I'm not fluent in Anishinaabe Moen, but I'm going to continue learning. Um, I can understand it. I can understand it really well, but like it's it's going to be a lifelong learning for me, which which I'm okay with. I um I'm definitely okay with, and these and these children and these youth are are helping me learn as well because the way that I was taught is like that next generation. There there are teachers as well, and it's just I guess so, especially with doing the work with finding our power together. A lot of these youth, because I, I'm sharing cultural teachings and different things like that, and for a lot of these youth it's their first time having access to traditional teachings. And that just really, it, it kind of like blew my mind. There were, I was just like, you know what, we're, there, a lot of work has been done. I don't want to discredit the work that's been done in the community, but it just shows like, you know, there, there's, a, there's a long way to go, but I'm trying not to focus on, I guess, the pragmatics of that and just trying to stay optimistic and hopeful and just keep leading by, leading by example. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> thank you, Niall. Shannon, please. Um, thank you. I was actually, it's, I'm, now I love what you said, and Lindsay as well. I just want to jump off that and think about, I think, in speaking of like the good way and the interconnectedness of that, I think a lot of what the work I do is trying to um, bring knowledge of that to the institution um that that's not because often they'll say walking in two worlds and i'll say you know but they're not we aren't we're in you know we're in we're in one world and we're act, sometimes asked to act in different ways but that doesn't change the interconnectedness and so trying to um bring the institution to a point where they they see that and see the value of understanding all of those pieces in education um, so not just using allowing students to use mental or physical skill sets but what is their heart knowledge and what is the interconnectedness within the institution and of their learning and if if we're not doing that then we're asking them to compartmentalize in a way that's probably unhealthy um, and so thinking about how we can we can pull that together whether that's in like a learning outcome or an activity um, and COVID has made that hard for sure but even just naming that and recognizing that that the energy that we need in the way that we learn is disrupted um, in the way that we're interacting right now. And um, Niall, you said this thing about our res your responsibility to those stories. And I think um, about how it's not a matter of owning land, it's responsibility to land. It's not about owning knowledge, it's about responsibility to knowledge. And that's a, a fundamental difference. And so when we think about um, art or the things that we know within the institution, it's about, and this, I mean, we're, we're speaking at UFT, that's not lost on me. We're, we're moving away from the proprietorship of knowledge and our responsibility to it. And that's a fundamental difference. And I think it's a, it's something that we have to grapple with um, if we're really going to, to move forward together in a good way. I guess I'm next. <laughs> Yeah, I think reflecting off of everybody um, and then yeah, think about living and working in a good way with my practice. Yeah, I think it just it inherently is there. And then I think about um, even when not when Niall said this lifelong journey and that's very like that's very much the case and like, it will be the case for everyone. And um, thinking about like, what did I need like as a youth or like, what did I want to learn and like connect with? Um, and I think back to like, yeah, when I was in my final year of high school and I, I discovered my, my school had like a, a tri-school like mentorship program with uh, Native, Native girls. Um, so I joined that. And then so through that program, I was like mentoring like girls like as young as like six and like and then I was like eight, six, 16, 17 at the time. Um, but then was learning like along with those girls, like the bear song for the first time and drumming and um, all these different things. Um, so that was like an example for me that like set that like president of like, like learning as I go and like there's no rush to these things and that like you can like learn these things while teaching and mentoring others. Um, and I think they are like reflecting that like to what I do like today and like past September um, organized an art show that we called Lavender Menace. 
Um, and it was to celebrate like indigenous queer presence, um, primarily at the Forks, which is a, a space in Winnipeg that was known for trade and just like a meeting place for millennia for indigenous peoples. And um, we wanted to like bring back that idea of indigenous queer presence, especially at the skate park. And there was this public, um, public spaces that we can put art up. Um, but then yeah, through, through this project and many others, I'm always thinking like, how can I involve others and have others learn and, and, and with this process with me. And um, so with that one ended up making it kind of this like dual mentorship where I had a photographer and a painter and then found younger artists, 10 and 12 years old to be mentored by those artists. And um, so these younger generations were also getting to, to be mentored and learn with these older generations of artists. Um, so I think that's yeah something for me that I've I've carried through in my experiences. <laughs> thank you, Annie, <clears throat> and thank you. <laughs> um, I want to go back to something that um, Shannon and Lindsay touched on a bit, um, and the idea of kind of compartmentalizing, um, and that that's not necessarily very healthy, or that it doesn't come naturally to kind of separate who you are from your work. Um, um, and I can imagine that that is obviously very different from, um, let's say, how U of T works, where we, <laughs> I guess, virtually are right now. Um, is that, is it working with, um, I guess, institutions or non-Indigenous organizations, does, is it harder to um, honor your teachings or does it, does that present a challenge? Does that make sense? Should I call us every time it's okay? <laughs> Shannon, you don't have your mic turned unmuted, so. Oh, is that, is that how you get to not be first? Because <laughs> I've learned an important lesson. Uh, <laughs> um, so if I understand the question, it's just um, the, the, the difficulty of not being able to separate those? Um, no, I guess I would say, no, I mean, wanting to not separate them mm -hmm. in a place where people tend to separate them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my job. So <laughs> <laughs> my position at, uh, at Centennial College is to um, teach teachers right now. So I'm not working with students directly. I'm training faculty and staff um, in helping them to understand a little bit more about the potential ways in which we can um, integrate a little bit more. So specifically, like I use the medicine wheel a lot um, and really focus on at a college, it's, you know, people are, faculty are very quick to understand where like uh, kinesthetic or the physical component is met through trades training. And, you know, we're typically we're on campus interacting with uh, physical attributes. So then that, that, that one's really easy. The, the mental component of the medicine wheel is met pretty easily through school. So it's um, a lot of my work is trying to um, help faculty understand where heart knowledge has place in post-secondary institution, and then um, helping them to understand that the spiritual component is not a religious component, but it's all my relations. And what does that look like in a, in a post-secondary institution? And that, that has place in that. So, um, you know, sometimes people come to me and be like, well, how am I supposed to do land-based learning or or do those things. And I'm like, that's not necessarily the only way we can think about interconnectedness. So um, talking about how do um, how do learning outcomes intersect with each other, um, both within the same course and across courses. So I think back to my days in university and my English class here, and my poli sci class there, and my history class there, and they were all siloed and not necessarily interconnected. And if they were, it's because it was like, you know, Chaucer one and Chaucer two. Um, there wasn't necessarily any other way that those things were interconnected and that uh, affected my learning and that that's not how I brought, was brought up to learn. Um, and so working with faculty to kind of push those Western barriers or colonial barriers of um, what constitutes a learning outcome, what constitutes a syllabus, and then um, what also constitutes an assessment. Um, and so this is where I have gotten the opportunity to work with artists um, and, and it, just in a variety of ways of pushing the boundaries of what is considered an assessment. Um, and 
and why we assume an essay or a test are the best ways to assess. And so then um, bringing in some indigenous pedagogies and the ways in which assessment works within community. Um, and I think that was a benefit of COVID is suddenly people were like, I am homeschooling my kid. And so I did math, science and art all in one by doing baking. And they're like, I'm a genius. And I was like, or, <laughs> or, uh, you know, this is a valid uh, approach to learning that has largely been um, diminished by the Western institution. And then if you're a fan of UDL, like universal design learning, um, acknowledging that that is that is appropriation that comes from indigenous ways of knowing and that um, that's a really fun new label on something that we were um, oppressed for doing. So those approaches to um, teaching were things that were to be taken from us by residential schools and are now being you know, repackaged and presented to us um, through a Western framework. And so um, th that's, that's what I do. I think that answers your question. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. <laughs> yes, um, sounds like you're great at your job, Shannon. Oh, <laughs> someone calls me. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Um, yeah, um, so I mean, it's great to hear about it from, um, I guess, the scale of the institution and working with, especially with, um, like in the education uh, sector. Um, I'm wondering how that may or may not translate into um, the art sector and maybe working with public art organizations um, and whether it may be, um, well, the artists here today, <laughs> if you've had any experiences, um, I guess, well, what like facing that or um, if you've had any positive experiences where you were able to, I suppose, show up fully, um, yeah. Annie, would you like to? Oh, Lindsay. <laughs> you want me to go? I'll go. <laughs> um, so as we're talking about it, it's making me think about, I definitely think that in the beginning of my career, I did a lot of that. Like starting to navigate, you know, working with other non-Indigenous arts organizations or just organizations generally. I think that there was this idea that, especially because when I started, that was like the beginning of reconciliation conversations and like legislation coming out. So, um, wow, I feel really old, but anyway. <laughs> um, but no, it was, it, I think that, so there was a big push for collaboration, right? Um, rightfully so. However, I thought, I realized in the beginning what was happening was that there was a lot of people wanting you to come in as an Indigenous artist, as an Indigenous person connected to um, your community. But I noticed that there was some certain nuances that would happen. So for example, if you went into those spaces and you started talking and they realized that you're, and maybe Niall can talk to this a bit too, but um, realizing that you're connected tr ceremonially and traditionally, um, there's this, then there was this extra expectation that maybe not necessarily was explicitly said, but you could feel it where it was like, give me all your knowledge, right? It was like, please give all your knowledge over so that we can understand, um, you know? And I think that people associate reconciliation with understanding what it's like, like trying to step into the indigenous experience when that's not necessarily what it really is, right? And there's a particular way that you navigate even, like even us as indigenous people, right? Um, and ceremony people as an extension, we don't just step into that right? Like that's a long process of, you know, showing up and learning, right? And being, hum being, having humility and humbleness and building relationship. I mean, like the primary thing that we firstly do, you know, is building a relationship with the land and you don't just go up and shake its hand and go, okay, we know each other now. And now you're going to tell me everything, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So it, that's something that I think was really interesting for me is, and when I went starting that, I was younger, right? So I didn't have, you know, the sense, the strong sense of self that I have now. Um, if you're thinking about it in terms of like, uh, you know, spiritual capacity, mental capacity, you know, all those kinds of things. Like I was not at the same place of where I am now. So when I go into those spaces now, um, 
And then also over time, I've been able to start to recognize when people have those patterns. So when, so I can sense that right off the top when that's, that's what this is being set up as. And then that combined with my social work knowledge, um, also understanding like historical trauma and colonial violence and like how those structures are created in a social con, like in the social mm-hmm. considerations. I'm like especially trained to identify those things now. So when I go into spaces and I can, and my bells start going off and my intuition sounding off, I just, you know, I, I used to back in the day, I would be a rebel about it and be like, I'm going to educate you. And then now I just don't do that <laughs> because you know what, there's, there's appropriate spaces to do that in. And, you know, there's also this whole idea of the responsibility, right? Like it's not our responsibility to, um, you know, hold and guide people in that unless that's the work you're doing. But in those kinds of situations, you know, that, that is a lot to put on to somebody. Um, so I recognized that in the beginning of those conversations that that was kind of the norm. And then I think that a lot of us started chiming in and saying like, no, there's a way that you can go about creating relationships that is more appropriate. Um, there's more appropriate ways of how you interact with this knowledge and also be more specific of what it is that you're really asking for, right? Because I think that a lot of times in my experience, people that are thirsting for the knowledge, it's not necessarily that they really want to, I mean, obviously indigenous people are beautiful and we're interesting and we have really amazing stories and people can learn from them for sure. Um, But the other thing that I always try to redirect people on is that every single person has a culture. Every single person has, every people have ceremony. Every, every, every group of people around the world have a relationship to their land base, right? So I think what's actually happening in that process is that because there's this, this is a bigger conversation now, I think what, they're, what people are seeing is they're seeing indigenous people, indigenous artists, indigenous helpers, reclaiming these things through these avenues. And it's a really beautiful process, but it's a mirror right like it's striking and it's it's building something up inside of themselves in recognition of that oh um I think I should be doing that right even if it's not conscious it's subconscious so that's what I've learned and gathered from that process so and that's also helped me not be so like gangster about it for lack of a better word (laughs) being like rah (laughs) you know so I it's allowed me to be more compassionate and kind because I understand the other side of it. And, you know, as Indigenous people, we remember, we, and we know, we know that intimately what it's like to not be, to not feel whole, right? So it's just the having a compassion and then helping people understand that. And then from those places, you can start creating some of those relationships, right? Um, so I've actually seen a shift over time since conversations about reconciliation started happening where people do understand those things you know they understand are starting to understand the importance of and significance of these issues and what we're supposed to be doing um and we even did it here today right with the land acknowledgement i'm going to say that's probably one of the best land acknowledgements i've heard in a long time because it was (laughs) detailed and it actually was talking about how because when i do them sometimes i don't really do them anymore to be honest but when i do them sometimes uh like most of the times i would be like well okay, yeah, it's great to do that, but why, right? Like, let's put it back to you guys. Like, why do you think we have to do this, right? Why do we need to do these things? Because I know why I do, but everybody has a reason of why they're doing these things and living in the places that they are, right? So um, yeah, that's kind of what I think about that. So is it difficult? I think it was difficult in the beginning when there was not as much conversation happening. Mm-hmm. now I think that it's a little bit easier for myself at least because a couple of things I just don't work with organizations that are not appro- approaching in a good way and don't know how to you know or, or not that they don't know how because if I can see that there's a real willingness to learn then I'm willing to support right I'm willing to do my part to be able to to create that um, good relationship but because I know the signs of it being a toxic thing I don't work with those people, right? So I just respect and, and empower myself and, you know, and in a sense too, you got to think that because of the interconnectedness, we do have a responsibility to be mindful of that because if we allow toxicity into our being as, you know, helpers, as artists, as people doing this work, um, in, a, 
by effect because of the interconnectedness, that's how we can also harm our community, right? So we have to be those good role models to show and stand up for those things and be like, okay, no, this is, you know, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm not willing to do. And it all goes back to relationships, right? So that's all I'm gonna say about that. I'm taking up a lot of time, I feel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, I really appreciate you. Um, I mean, saying all of that, especially the, the notion of um, reconciliation is not, you know, non-Indigenous people trying to, or uh, kind of, embody what it is to be indigenous because that's not just not it's not it it's not right um and i think um yeah i mean it's very i think it's very kind of you to kind of see that um you know it comes from a place of other people wanting to become whole um but yeah maybe it is um from what i'm understanding it uh not every like there's time for, to learn and there's time to, I guess, uh, work with the artists and also asking you to, um, like if I were an organization, I were to ask you to kind of work with us as an artist, um, I should be clear about whether I'm asking you to work with us as an artist or if I'm asking you to come and teach us and become our educator and like share all the knowledge that you have. Um, so, um, yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, Any, I believe we, I wanted to ask you next. Sure. Yeah. There's lots, lots, lots have been said already about this that I'd, I've already been thinking about. And um, yeah, I think basically, yeah, just I think for me, those differences come like when organizations like separate that sometimes all they need is just like an art piece or like, like there's been cases where it's like they just need a mural and then they turn it into this like big political thing where it's whatever that their organization hasn't worked with indigenous whatever for how long, whatever it might be. Um, and it ends up being this big, it's like, you could really just like send an email with like how much you're paying me, how long it would take for a timeline and like what all the logistics. And then if it works for my schedule, I'll tell you yes or no. Um, but then you put this like heavy like thing on our shoulders of having to carry that, like, I guess that idea, like, that indigenous lives like, are in inherently political. I guess that, that's where that comes through is that we have to like navigate these weird like approaches of like opportunities. And um, like in that case, it was a project that like I desperately wanted to say no to, um, but it's like, and then also yeah, just being like a younger artist up and coming, like you need money sometimes and <laughs> you just need like a paycheck. Um, and like sometimes it's like you're put on like a in a position where you feel like you like need to be that representation maybe um like it's like maybe the represent that spot on like a board or something is going to go like empty otherwise and um so you get put in these positions i think sometimes where there's this pressure um and i think for me being a recent graduate it's like relearning how to like it's okay to say no to a lot of these things and like you don't have to have these pressures or in that case with like this project where i was like you just want a mural um reapproach them and like with a counter offer of like maybe this could like involve other artists or like could be done in a different way um and then they ended up being like receptive to that um so i think like yeah sometimes i like, get yeah, like for that case like not being totally just like blowing off opportunities sometimes i think you can tell if there's intention there to be that there's like maybe good there um but yeah, I think like Lindsay said, like, I think it comes with experience. Like you can tell when certain spaces that there isn't that genuine um, care and yeah, thinking of like, like the land acknowledgement and um, like there's certain spaces that you don't need a land acknowledgement because it's like the work that's being done there or like the people that are in those spaces, like you don't need to spell those things out. Whereas like something with like a university space, it's like you need to like really acknowledge what that means and then it's become this like nature of just like copy and paste whatever um so yeah the way that it was done today like I think reflects like how like going forward like organizations approaching artists like being very intentional with like knowing your own role as a personal person within like an organization and then that role of that organization and like so be just yeah being like, aware and conscious of those things and always just being reflective of that I think is going to be helpful in navigating those relationships that you're building and that trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate that you're speaking kind of to the different scales um, of that, of being genuine. Um, 
and yeah, being genuine as a person working in an organization or institution, but also knowing whether you're the institution or the organization you're in shares those values and kind of where you stand with that and how you can also, um, I guess, implement implement or add on to that genuineness. I don't know if that's the word. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Niall, I see your mic is unmuted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and just talking on that as well, um, especially with organizations, it's hard. I, and when I was earlier, I guess, on earlier in my career, uh, being brought into these big organizations and just to make sure that we're not tokenized. Um, and like, especially being a storyteller and like I, like I said, I had the privilege of growing up in ceremony with the teachings and, and, and in my community. But I guess for another, I guess for an, another indigenous young artist coming in, it's like Lindsay was saying, you, you're expected to be the popular educator you're expected they're almost like expecting you to 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 carry all this traditional knowledge to to, to know the language and it, and if and if that organization doesn't have doesn't have supports ready for that like it can be very triggering uh triggering for an individual it can be very triggering to to a young community member that doesn't know their spirit name that doesn't have that connection because of the history of colonization within this country doesn't have that connection to their community doesn't have that connection to their teachings and there has to be in, in my experience and from what i've seen like there, there has to be support and, and i guess the support for that because it can it can really set an individual back on their on their healing journey i find especially with truth and reconciliation it's like I, I felt like Canada jumped the gun and, and we, we, we went right to reconciliation. We're trying to all do the reconciliation work when in actuality, I feel like we're still, we're still on that truth. We're still finding out these truths. A lot of our communities are still finding out the, the, the truths of their own history. Like I, I, can only, I can only speak to the teachings and, and to my own experience as, as like, I don't speak for all indigenous people. I don't speak for all Anishinaabe people. But like something with truth, like a lot of people don't even know that I would that I attended a federal Indian day school up until 1996. And like these, and people don't know this. They don't even know like what a day school is. Like I, what was the name of mine? I guess it was St. Mary's um, Federal Indian Day School. And and people, I don't know, it just seems like they think like it happens so far in the past but this is a part of this is a part of our contemporary history and something that as me as i'm, I'm only speaking to my, about myself that i'm still trying to, to heal from and to understand and and, that, and that's really reflected within my work that's why i paint those stories that's why i paint that's why i do the work that i do is 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 to bring that history and bring that understanding but then also bring it forward in a good way um i love hearing about I love hearing about the like something as, as small as the not small I shouldn't say that because I don't want to 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 diminish it but like even the land acknowledgement I I I I've almost stopped doing land acknowledgements for organizations because I'm saying no like it's your turn do the land acknowledgement you know I can help guide you but but it would really mean a lot to me if if you put in that care to do the land acknowledgement. Oh, I, you know, I'm really hesitant because I'm I'm afraid of messing up the language. I can't. I don't know how to pronounce this the, this word properly. This is, this is like try. Put put your good mind and your good heart forward. Try. That's all we can do is try. I learned how to use English and say Cornwall properly. It's like okay, try to learn how to say a neashignikaming properly. And what does that word mean? And I don't. That's just a little bit. I'm I'm pretty long-winded as Lindsay knows, so it's <laughs> so it's kind of hard for me to shut off, but just creating safe spaces and not putting that expectation that all indigenous people are those are those knowledge keepers and understanding that through the history of colonization, it's like that it can be very triggering and damaging to to put that expectation on on young artists that are coming in to to and that are expected to know all these things you know they're expected to know canadian history history of colonization they're expected to know they're expected to be i guess ceremonial they're expected to be 
all of these different things. And I just wanted to, you know, if you're going to have meaningful relations with, with indigenous artists, because I don't even really like to call myself an artist because in my community, artists are, are they're, they're historians, they're botanists, they're, they're scientists, they're astrophysicists, they're, they're so much more. So like, to, 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 to I guess, honor that, to, to, to honor that properly. And, and, to, and to allow a good space and, and give time for meaningful relationships with not only an individual artist, but also with, with, with communities, give time for that. Like, are you trying, are you bringing me in so it looks good on your funding cycle or, your, or for your annual report? Or is this like an actual relationship that you wanna build upon and, 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 put that, and put that good heart and that good mind forward to build meaningful, meaningful relationships. Not like, okay, there's a bunch of nice pictures in our annual report and I'll never hear from this organization again because they extracted what they needed to. And then that, and then it's done. That's, that's, that's a little bit. Miigwech. Um, Nile, I, I like, thank you so much. I wanna just build off that what you've just said and I think in a, in a couple ways. And, and one is that um, when you're working on a project, whatever it is at an institution, um, I think you need to be very clear about your expectations because I think often someone will say something as indigenous and then they'll ask one artist to speak for all in this monolithic way to add for all indigenous peoples. And I think it's important that if you're trying to have this, you know, um, something that's showing First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and Lost Generations all together, then you, you have to think about your budgeting and how you're going to hire artists from multiple um, groups or nations. And, um, and what kind of education, so this is part of the work that I do do with um, arts institutions is bring, they will bring me in before the artist comes in um, to talk about, you know, what's the difference between a nation and a community and a clan and not asking that person to come in and do the reconciliation training, you, you know, that's not that artist's job. And so thinking about what kind of training you're going to do for your team before you bring the artist in. Um, and usually I ask if I can pre meet with the artist and the indigenous employees first so that we can talk about what are the needs and expectations there a little bit because the other thing that happens is you know an indigenous employee who's trying to just do whatever their job is maybe they're um a math faculty or maybe they're you know working um as like reception at the the gallery are suddenly asked to do this work and as Niall said this is really triggering if they are someone who's trying to compartmentalize um they're often forced into it and this does affect self-identification numbers where people are like if i identify am i going to have to do all this labor Right. So I think, or am I going to be triggered in these harmful ways? And then the other thing I really want to build off what you said, Niall, is that I think it, people need to expect that they're going to make mistakes because we haven't had enough truth. And so, you know, do you already have a plan in place for if a mistake happens? Is there a way for the artist to communicate that to you? Um, do you already know how to do a restorative justice circle? Um, anticipating those mistakes, because I think that in my experience when where i have worked or organizations i have worked with and they've made a mistake um, it takes months to repair that damage because they have no idea how to um, correct that and that so much labor is put back on the artist because they either have to carry that harm for months before we can have a circle or they're having to explain to the institution how to undo the harm that they did and it's just this enormous amount of labor that's then put on the artist um, or the or the speaker or whomever has been harmed, but it, historically I've seen the most harm happen to artists. Um, and so, and in my experience, sometimes we're looking at months before we can um, get to the point of everyone understanding how to repair the harm. Uh, so really putting in some of that legwork and being reflective about Western timelines in comparison to indigenous timelines. So, um, thinking about if you do have a grant, um, yeah, what time, what is time? It's a social construct. I don't know what day of the week it is. Um, but thinking about, um, uh, Lindsay, I became very good at reading lips as a teacher, by the way. Um, so, uh, you know, cause I want to know what they're saying about me. Um, but you know, 
thinking about time and I just had this grant presented to us and it was a huge grant and it was a great idea. And I was like, oh, the timeline on this isn't long enough for me to build a relationship. I need a, I need someone to do, I need an artist um, to do florals. So, but I was like, I don't have enough time in the government had a six month timeline. I was like, oh, that's not enough time for me to build a relationship. I can't take that grant. And like my my team was horrified <laughs> and I was like, we can't accept it. It's not enough time to build the relationship we need for the goal that we have. And so I think part of that is a, these are big pieces and they're big learning pieces. Um, but if we tried to use the timeline that was came with the grant, we would have caused a harm to the artist. And so that meant we had to walk away from the grant. And I think that those are really tough, but important decisions we're going to have to start making. So thank you now for bringing up some of those really important pieces. Linda, please. Okay, just just because while you're talking, I'm thinking about something else too. I totally agree with everything. Um, and the other part of that that's interesting is that not only is there considerations that should be made for supporting artists, right? Um, indigenous staffing, all those types of things. But if you do start to do some of the truth telling, you also have to be prepared to deal with supporting individuals who are gonna go through a grieving process on the flip side of that. Because oftentimes I've, I've been in a lot of situations where you know I've asked to do a project, we do that. And then I'm doing debriefing with staff and it's like, okay, well, where was the support for the people that are a part of this, this circle, right? Um, and then that's an extra expectation on top of it to an indigenous person, right? Um, and especially if somebody who doesn't necessarily have that experience, I'm fortunate that I have that experience, but that also doesn't mean that I should be obliged to do it just because I have it <laughs> right and and that's a lot of work like I you know um healing processes like you're saying that a concept of time it's it's not like it starts stop it starts and stops right like it's a it's a continual thing like I'll be doing that till I'm no longer here you know I'll be doing that on my earth walk the whole time so it's that recognition too that needs to be creating safe spaces not only for indigenous peoples but also the other side of that reconciliation piece as well because that's super important and that's work that that part of the community can take up in in you know themselves and it's actually very empowering and um that's how you're going to support those relationships moving forward too you know that's all i wanted to add thank you yeah for sure i mean i think with i think a lot of institutions and organizations right now are trying to um you know implement diversity into their uh, well into their organizations um, but the piece that's often missing is like creating an actual safe space in that institution or creating the structure that protects and supports um, indigenous people black people poc queer people etc um, and so i think you're um i mean thank you for speaking to that the, the idea that you you can't just be like inviting in indigenous artists or indigenous folks and just asking them to like do their work and just you know deal with everything um and the organization needs to actually put in put in the work to make that environment supportive and like do the work and learn the knowledge and um yeah so that um so that the experience isn't actually traumatic and something good comes out of it um you know other than the mural or other than the art piece um please feel free to add anything else but um can i just jump in i think that yeah. we, we may have skimmed over something that niall said that i really want to come back to and that that's like the relationship just like the time doesn't end Lindsay was saying that annie was saying this i think if there's an important message and you know Rhonda, you're doing a great job of summarizing congratulate because it's hard it's a lot of things happening here you're doing an excellent job i think um you know niall was saying about that relationship and i think it's really an important takeaway to think what is my long term plan as an individual, but also as an institution to this relationship, because what does happen and, you know, Danny and I have experienced this in our work is where when the grant is done work, the relationship work becomes our own personal work. And that's 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 great when you're at you know project one or two of your career, but now when you're at project like 30 or 40 <laughs> and you're not getting institutional support, usually in the form of time. To maintain these but the institution does want these relationships still um you know something unhealthy begins to happen 
And and often what happens, I think, is that people who hold those relationships start to say, well, those are like, I'm not going to share those with the institution anymore because I'm not gaining support. And so I think, you know, Niall was like, when the piece of art is done, the relationship is not done. I think, and I'm paraphrasing you, I'm sorry if I did it wrong, but I think that that's a really, really important takeaway um, to, to think about, you know, when you look at that art, are you thinking about that relationship and are you honoring that relationship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can't just be about the product that is sold and then that's it, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to hop in there too, just to add one thing quickly with that. Um, yeah, I think just like thinking about um, like relationships, like um, and treating them as like living beings, like like once you have like an established like relationship, you're not like friends like forever, like relationships can fall off if you don't give them attention, you don't tend to them, you don't nurture them. Um, yeah, so like, yeah, you shouldn't be going into these things like with like ideals of short term relationship building, it should be with intentions that like maybe officially through a contract, it's going to be short term, but ideally like this artist or person you're going to be connecting with like in the future beyond that. Um, and yeah, making sure those like debriefs happen when like things happen or just in general, like even just good meetings, making sure everyone feels good and doing those debriefs and um, yeah, but make, yeah, first and foremost, just yeah, treating relationships as like living, living organisms almost and that need to be taken care of. Thank you, Annie. Um, this is maybe a slight change of direction, but um, I was wondering if we could maybe speak a little bit about uh, the unfortunate COVID-19 and whether it's had an impact um, on all your work. Um, I mean, I know we're meeting here on Zoom. <laughs> um, not sure how, <laughs> if you like that or not. <laughs> um, maybe you could, yeah, maybe if you could just speak to um, kind of how the current context has affected your work and also uh, your relationships with um, organizations and maybe if, um, you know, you have any uh, positive or let's just say positive <laughs> models um, of just uh, maybe meeting with people or working with people in the virtual world. Would anyone like to start? <laughs> I'll start I, as a, cause I think the artists and their like grouping is great. So I'll go and then I'm gonna, I want to hear them as a group. Um, I think the most important thing is for me about moving online was doing immediately some work about digital um, equity and digital sovereignty. Um, and really, you know, I today's um, stuff is re being recorded. It's not behind a paywall, but at my work, I immediately was like, you cannot record stuff because I won't put knowledge behind a paywall. Um, and so uh, really taking some time to think about um, uh, the digital gap that Indigenous communities experience and, and really like all marginalized communities um, are dealing with at this time. And then um, really thinking about digital sovereignty and thinking about, you know, when you bring in these three amazing artists to speak today and to share their experiences um, and you record that, are you, you know, they've all mentioned in different ways, the mining of their art or the mining of their knowledge. So thinking a lot about um, what those expectations are when we start to, um, I notice, you know, none of them are showing art today, but what, what if they had been and what, what then happens to the ownership of that? So really putting a lot of thought into sovereignty and equity when it comes to this. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah. Oh, Annie. <laughs> Game. Um, <laughs> I'll hop in with my experience with COVID. Um, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely changed a lot. And then, like, a lot, in a lot of ways, I'm like just as busy. It's just like not as much as like in groups of people. And like, so it's just like more emails. And like, I, I don't know. I was doing a lot of the Zooms at first, like workshops, and it just like got too much for me, even though I wasn't even like having to like Zoom for like work meetings or anything. It's just the presence and like, the nature of it. Um, so I think like um, what's shifted is like um, 
the project's doing like a lot, lot of like more public art trying to like figure out ways to like get art just like out there for people to see because of that like maybe that digital gap I was thinking of I used to work a lot of the projects that I do are through graffiti art programming here in Winnipeg um and then they had a they called it studio 393 and that's where I was working at as a visual arts instructor and it's for mu music and dance too but a lot of these youth like would come through just to use like the laptops and computers or just to have like a space just to have some food and stuff um that space we had to close it doesn't even have a sink for us to use so we can't even open it until like everyone's vaccinated essentially because you can't wash your hands safely um but like I'm thinking about that space and how like I haven't seen any of those youth like since and like like there's a like, definite gap with like how to like in like work with these youth that don't have those, those um readily available technology at hand and um so also through graffiti art programming we just like did a project um where we cut out different like I designed these different cutouts of different animals um and then like a lot a lot of my like work just through learning and researching on my own of like just basic language I have a little creed dictionary that I use and um just like community members what I learned from um and that's like where I like to get my knowledge and share it so using these animals and then language and created like kind of like a scavenger hunt in the neighborhood so we cut out um like aluminum panels and I painted them to be these animals and then they in installed them on different like fences and whatever in the neighborhood and then we also created like a coloring book and then delivered those coloring books of the same animals to all the different uh, houses in the neighborhood so that youth can like color and like have something at home but then also if they go out and about they can see these animals and try to find them um mm -hmm. so like that is an example that was like i thought was a really great way to um not be stuck to just like the online format of of mm -hmm. things and and really integrate people with um yeah maybe they don't know like who graffiti art programming is or who like i'm in as, as an artist but they can like engage with the art um yeah mm -hmm. and they can go on walks too <laughs> yeah yeah especially now it's getting nicer, nicer outside especially here in winnipeg <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure um thank you annie um now maybe um touching back on the you speaking on kind of the creating sustainable relationships and long meaningful relationships um that go beyond the artwork um i'm wondering has it how has it been kind of creating maybe new relationships during COVID? Um, if that's something that um, you've experienced or if um, there are kind of preferred ways for you to um, do that. Like if something has worked well, is it maybe, I don't know, an, an initial meeting, just getting to know the person that you're working with or something like that? Yeah, def definitely. I, um, I talk about this a lot, but like, especially with COVID, like it's in our stories or especially within my community of, of these great sicknesses that will circle the earth every every so often so for me it's kind of like i look at it like like it's a huge like my heart goes out to all those that are suffering out there it really does but for me it it kind of just shows and just tells like how wonderful and how amazing our ancestors were at recognizing these patterns within creation and then allowing times for that for that healing to happen like covid covid has been really tough usually like um i'm i travel across the country going into different communities leading um, cultural teachings storytellings um through you know mural projects and different things like that or going on medicine walks nature walks but i find what this what this pandemic has, has done because i heard a lot of I, I heard a lot of moaning and groaning before the pandemic of like youth not showing up or like they're 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 just not there where are they it's like this lost community this lost generation of of these community members and what i feel like this has done is it's, it's really taught us that that adaptation into this environment of that of that digital world is like yes the youth are still gathering the youth are still talking they're there. They have, there's this huge, beautiful community there. And it's just, we, I guess, it forced us to adapt and, and, to, and to look at these new environments and, and, and learn about these environments. Because like, especially with Finding Our Power Together, usually we go and deliver this programming in communities. We go up into Northern Ontario, 
Um, but now we, we've totally switched over. It's, it's all online right now. And what, which allowed, which opened up the door to, when we started our first program on building our bundle, um, it, we, we put the call out and, and youth were, 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 were signing up from all across Canada. Even, we even got some people from the United States that were wanting to partake in, in the program. So it, in terms of that, it showed us like the youth are there. It's just, and, and, and they want that support. They, they want these teachings. So it's, for me, it's kind of like, it forced us all to go to where the community is. Cause like as Basil would always tell me, Basil, one of my teachers would always tell me, is like, you can be a storyteller, but if you're not going to where the people are, you're just sitting there and you're just gonna be flapping your gums, just speaking into the wind. It's like, you need art demands an audience, just like that storytelling demands that audience. And it's really, 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 I, I find it quite amazing to, that it forced all of these different organizations and, and like dinosaur organizations to really look at their programming and their methodologies of delivering programming and becoming very digitally competent and, and, being, able, and being able to reach the, these young ones. Because like, I always heard that grumbling, like, oh, they're, they're, they're not there. They're so, it's like, yeah, the environments are, are changing. That, 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 that's what happens. And, and it's forced us all to kind of catch up to that and to, and to meet these youth where they are, not telling these youth to come to where I am, come, come to where I am, come, come to me. It's like, actually, you know what, we'll, we'll come to you. And that's a little bit about that. Thank you so much, Nala. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so I've taken a lot of time, <laughs> but I've also learned a lot. Um, I'll, so thank you again. I'll pass it on to Rajpri, um, who has some questions from the audience. Hi. Yeah, this has been really insightful, and I'm very grateful to be here and learning and hearing all this um, amazing and points and knowledge that you've made. Um, we have about like 10 minutes left, including the raffles. I'm wondering if we could almost do like a rapid fire audience <laughs> question period. Um, I'll start with Karen Mills' question is, have you had any experience working in the framework of public art competitions? And can you share that experience and your hopes for change? Uh, I guess you can let like this, that mural that, um, that I was like, they just want like a mural for the wall and they ended up being this big thing. Where, and it ended up was gonna be like spec work, but they wanted three artists to compete for a design and then they were gonna choose one artist to paint it. And then, so then I'm like, well, you're making us like put all this pressure on us to like be the most like Indian or whatever. And then like to compete for that almost. And it was just like, so whatever, like I, I put forward that, that they should um, make it into more of like a collaborative um, opportunity as opposed to um yeah and so then ended up the artists and myself um we all collaborated on design it was like through zoom like this and like photoshop and emailing um and then all got a chance to to paint um and be a part of it and get that experience um so ideally like projects maybe going forward like instead of like choosing like single people to get like lumps large lump sums of money you can disperse that and build more relationships that way um yeah no that's a sounds like a great idea i don't know why they don't do that more often. Um, and then Janine has a question for the artists. Of what art forms or modalities do you enjoy doing and why? Which I think is actually, we actually didn't really talk about your art form. I can jump in. Yeah. Um, so predominantly my practice is, so I'm, I'm trained in drawing and painting. Um, so that's predominantly where I started from and I still do painting. I actually do, I need to do more of it because I haven't been doing it in a bit. Um, but that, and then predominantly like the facilitation piece around, um, community arts, I've been doing a lot of that. And I'm also a bead, like I do bead work. So I do a lot of bead work, leather work. So restoring some of that and I'm self-taught, um, unfortunately, because, you know, again, disruptions from colonization, right? Like I didn't learn that how we normally would learn that traditionally, right? From our aunties, from our grandmothers, from our mothers, right? Um, so I do that. And um, I also dabble in a bit of photography. And then recently I started doing, I'm actually like getting ready to do um, a video series. So I'm going to be like trying my hand at doing some 
film, <laughs> which is like really, I feel like a stretch, but maybe not. I don't know. But um, so I'm going to be doing that and releasing a series pretty soon um, about uh, talking about some different issues and basically like reframing things for the community and like reconnecting back to um, it's basically like a storytelling around like how to get back to community, right? For people who are in um, high trauma, high crisis situations. So yeah, so that's kind of what I do mostly. Yeah. Annie and Niall, do you want to jump in? I guess like for me, paint like I've been a painter and I guess an image maker my my entire life I'm not formally trained so I always feel pretty intimidated when I go on these panels with people that are formally trained um <laughs> I've just been my earliest memories have been painting and drawing I've been I don't know I see imagery all the time and I just have that I guess ability to to draw that from my good mind and put it onto it and put it onto onto a surface um but for me that like i said before like it's not just painting or, or as it's not just painting to me it, it is it's it's living um it, it it has spirit it contains my history i whenever i paint and i'm painting or drawing stories or or florals that that my that are from my my family like i can literally sometimes hear my grandma and my grandpa's voice and, I, and like i feel so so connected that way and and for me it's it, it's it's a methodology of of healing of, of healing through my own personal of my own personal history and also my my, my family's history of growing of of being indigenous in, in canada and like going right back like it's a, it's a i guess it's a way of me learning my language relearning my language it, it's a way for me to to, to pass on pass on those teachings and that understanding to, to the next generation, because that's that, to me, that's so important. Lindsay mentioned that earlier, but we all come from creation stories. And Basil always, he put put this fear into me. I wouldn't say fear, but always, it's just it's like, you know, everybody looks at their creation stories as something that's so far in the past. They're so disconnected. When people talk about their creation stories, it, 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 it it's done. When in actuality, our, our creation stories are still unfolding, and I'm an active participant within this story. So it's kind of like, what is my what is my duty? What's my responsibility to this ongoing legacy of the Anishinaabe? Do I, you know, what am I going to make that choice to take from this legacy? Which is fine. I, it's a choice. The beautiful gift is I, is I have choice, or am I going to choose to add to that legacy of the Anishinaabe? Because time especially within Western society, it, it's, it's crazy. But like, we have to remember a couple hundred, in a couple hundred years from now, we're, we're the ancestors. We're gonna be the ancestors. And it's kind of like, what, 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 what story do I, what do I wanna leave for my great grandchildren? They're gonna be telling stories of, the, of, the, of this sickness that circled the earth. What, what can I do to, to, to add to that legacy? And make sure that that next generation coming in feels feels, if not rooted within within their within their within their identity, but at least then feel like you know what the environment's a little bit more loving, it, it's a little bit more nurturing, it's a little bit more inviting. It, it it's going to be easier for these young children to look up at the stars and and have dreams and to have hopes and not go to school the next day and have that all discredited where they're feeling hopeless. Because right now, especially within this pandemic, there, there, there's a huge, there's huge crises going on. And we're not just talk, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to like one up everybody's trauma, but like right now we're, we're going through an opiate um, pandemic as well. We're going through the, the, a suicide pandemic and people don't really want to look at these things. And it's like, yeah, you know what? Canada is doing great with, with the truth. And I might be taking up too much time, but this is a, to me, this is a very important point. It's like, yeah, you know what? Canada is doing great on their truth and reconciliation. And, and you know what? The 60s scoop money's coming out. The, the residential school money's coming out. There's these big payouts for, for the Indian day schools. But I've noticed that since all of these payouts is happening, that actually opioid addiction and suicide 
numbers have gone through the roof because they're we're just the country's just throwing monies at these things and now actually looking at, at that history and seeing and putting those and putting those those I guess those structures in place to, to help these young individuals that, that are still healing from 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 their trauma. And I know within my reserve, like there, there, there's a suicide epidemic going on because you know what the government gave a gave all this money out, but didn't put anything else in place. So there's all these community members walking around with this sadness in their heart, and they just don't know why. So with my art, for me, it's it's a way to push the, that that creation story forward, and ju and just and and I guess I always like to say my grandma always said this is like you you build these butterfly gardens or you plant these butterfly gardens, just have these spaces where, where that next generation, cause, cause I'm an, I'm, I'm an uncle now. I have to admit that I'm not a youth anymore. I'm like we're aunties and uncles now, my generation. Make a space where, the, where these youth, where these kids can come in and they feel safe to explore their identity, to push their boundaries and, and, and to learn in a good way. So they, they can, they can take our legacy, our beautiful legacy and histories, and bring those forward into those into the next generations. Um, I think that's such a great point to end on. <laughs> like, my job. thank you so much. Um, and Lindsay, I'm also really excited to see some of those films. Um, we have all the artist bios on the website, and I'll be sharing the link. But please follow them on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, if you can follow people on Facebook, um, as well as their website. So uh, again, thank you so much. Um, really grateful to be here in space and hear um, all of your thoughts. I want to pass it to Tai to start end with our raffle and our final thank yous. And so if we um, we didn't get through all the audience questions, but I'm sure we'll all continue to think about this throughout the whole day. Okay, if no one has anything else to add, I'm going to ask artists to share the social media handles in the chat so that we have access to their amazing artwork. Okay, then now I'm going to share the raffle link in the chat. Please make sure to fill out your name and email to participate in the raffle and we'll send our emails to the winners in the following week. We're also going to post the list of winners on the event website. The raffle prize are from our artists in the panel as a way to proudly support their art creation. We have one hoodie from Mikizay Creations, one print of Lindsay's work from Likely General, and a create an, an initiative be more than calendars from Annie. If anyone has questions or comments about anything we discussed today, feel free to send us an email. Please also pay attention to our final report coming out in April, which will summarize the knowledge we've learned from artists and literature, and also recommend our recommendation and strategies on how to sustain meaningful and equitable working relationships. We'll send it out through email in, uh, in April. Please have a look if you're interested. Okay, now I'm going to pass it back to Danny to close. Hi, what a privilege to close this amazing discussion. Um, Niall, Annie, Lindsay, Shannon, students, uh, amazing job. We're just, yeah, just very lucky to sit with all of your knowledge and, um, and to have your time. And yeah, I mean, there are very few words that will summarize how grateful I am and how, and I can tell you that uh, I've gotten a number of uh, private messages just saying like, this is amazing. And so I wanna echo, this is amazing. Um, I think that it, it's a reflection that these are discussions that we don't have enough and that people want to learn and they want to think about this, but that it's hard to find a uh, space, safe, brave space um, to do this. And so thank you. Um, Zoom goodbyes are really weird because we're all gonna push a red button and then we're just boop, gone and back to our real life. So I acknowledge that that's going to be weird in a minute. And I um, would also like to say artists, uh, please keep an eye on your mailboxes. In real life, we would have absolutely um, actually, you know, asked you properly with SEMA and, and in proper tradition, and we couldn't do that. And so I thank you for working around that. Um, but we would love to send you a gift. And so we'll make sure to do that. 
And everybody who showed up today, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the students, I'm I'm so grateful that you know that the support was there for this event. And uh, yeah, absolutely happy to carry on these conversations later. Um, I think most people have my email. If not, um, you can find me at U of T. And so, thank you. We're going to push the red button and end our discussion. But uh, thank you so much, everybody. Miigwech. Miigwech.